Okay, so this is just one example. I wanted to show you of a physical example of where you have lymph tissue that lines the gut. So this is something called a Peyer's patch. And this is structurally similar to like your tonsils. And what these patches do, is, so this is a, a patch of immune, immune cells that are in your, in your gut and they are monitoring the bacteria population that's passing through your gut. So this is just one example. I just wanted to show you because I think this is interesting. Because these bacteria are producing these compounds, these cells can say whether or not this is a pathogen, this is something that should be here, you know, we should elicit a response, and then it can, it can send the attack and it can hand off this bacteria to the lymphocytes in order to help control that population. Um, so lots of really cool examples of how it is that your body is monitoring these populations. So there are a number of benefits that bacteria have beyond their direct effects in this communication, and I guess some of this is related to their communication and controlling some of the functions of the body. Uh, one of those is that they help to adjust your pH. So who in here gardens? Is anybody a gardener? Okay, so pH is one of the absolute most important measurements when you're talking about soil health. You can have loads of nutrition in your soil, but it is not available for plant uptake unless you have the appropriate pH. Your body works the same way. So for example, your bones actually act as like a savings account for minerals. So we tend to focus on calcium, 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 but your bones are really complex. There's a lot more going on than just calcium. So you've got magnesium, potassium, phosphorus, um, and calcium, and then this protein matrix. And basically when your pH is off, your bones will release these minerals into your blood and into your body to try to get your pH back in balance. So pH is very important. I mean, so, so when you are looking at bone health, a more comprehensive approach is to really try to get a diversity of minerals, healthy proteins, things like that, if you're trying to protect the strength of your bones over time. Um, so, so these bacteria can help adjust your pH. They can also create biofilms. When we think about biofilms, we're generally thinking about a negative thing. Um, when you, bacteria are single-celled organisms, but they have the potential to work together in colonies, and they can form these really tight, they're called biofilms, and, and uh, this is a lot of what antibiotic resistance, biofilms are responsible for this because these biofilms, these antibiotics are not able to penetrate these bacteria. But this can actually be a beneficial thing too. You can have these biofilms that form in your gut that can take up residence that would be taken up by something less desirable. So it's not always a negative thing. Um, bacteria produce anti-inflammatory compounds, including those short chain fatty acids that I talked about that they produce in your colon that are an essential nutrient that you need. They control insulin and glucose metabolism, appetite and fat deposition, and they also influence production and quality of endogenous substances like bile. So what I mean by this is that you're going to produce bile no matter what. I mean, in most instances, unless there's something extremely wrong, but if you have the right bacteria, the quality of your bile is going to be much better. So lots of different benefits that these bacteria are having on our health. So then we start to wonder, well, then what do we eat, right? You know, we want to feed this microbial population, and we want to support our bodies with food. And so what I would like to argue is that the impacts of food on health are much bigger than we give them credit for. So in general, when people are talking about health foods or trying to get healthy, they're talking about the nutritional value of the food. And we have broken food down into its parts by saying that the nutritional value of food is limited to the fats, carbohydrates, proteins, vitamins, and minerals that are in those foods. We're not giving it enough credit when we do that. There's a lot more to food than just those parts. So what I would like to present too is that the foods you eat are controlling the presence or absence of certain microbiota. So it's not just fuel for you, it's fuel for all of these organisms that play a vital role in your health and in your immunity. The last thing that I'd like to argue, and I'll talk a little bit more about this when I talk about growing practices, is that we are largely discrediting food by ignoring the benefits of all of these phytochemicals, phytonutrients, and different con chemical constituents that we don't even know what they are. So plants don't have a nervous system. That's how we are, that's how our cells are communicating with each other is through this system of nerves. I mean, there's 
you know, we have neurotransmitters and hormones and all of those things as well, but plants don't have as complex of a system of communication, which means they have to produce a lot of different uh, chemicals. These phytochemicals are used in signaling, protection. Um, they are causing the plant to respond in the way that it needs to respond in its environment. And there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of these things. And we have only identified a fraction of them. And we don't even know what a lot of them do that we have identified. And then many of the ones that we have identified are powerful antioxidants, anti-carcinogens. I mean, they have measurable benefits for the body. So what I would argue is that when you're thinking about a healthy diet and supporting your body with healthy foods, you got to think outside the box. It's more, it's not, it doesn't boil down to fats, proteins, carbohydrates, vitamins, and minerals. There's a lot more to it than that. So I want to talk about some of the known dietary influences, some of the, um, and this is generally a lot of carbohydrates are, are the type of fuel that these bacteria and these microbiota are looking for. So I will talk about some of these not known dietary influences, but then I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about what you shouldn't be eating because I do think that's an important part of this as well. So basically, these bacteria want carbs. They want carbs that you can't digest. Cows eat grass all day and turn into this enormous creature. We cannot do that. <laughs> um, so we have to, we're not digesting, like if we were to eat grass all the time, there's so many, there's so much fiber and different resistant starches in grass that we can't actually utilize. Um, that's why that would never be a suitable diet for a human is just to eat grass. So there's, carbohydrates are in all sorts of different forms. Some of them you can use, some of them you can't. But it's these ones that you can't that are the ones that the bacteria and the microbes are most interested in themselves. So these are things like resistant starch, non-starch polysaccharides. Um, and this really just depends on the chemical structure of these things. But I think if you can just remember that they're fiber-like, it's fiber and other fiber-like substances is what these microbes are most interested in eating. Um, and then they can be lumped together in something that people call MAX, which is microbiota accessible carbohydrates. Um, so you'll sometimes hear them called that. I did add a picture of potatoes up here because um, does anyone take a probiotic? So a few of you, does anyone take a prebiotic? Okay, so, some, so a prebiotic is food for the probiotic. Um, so you can buy, so a good probiotic should have the prebiotic already in the formula, in general. Um, that's one of the things that I look for when I'm looking for a probiotic. Um, but you can also buy these very expensive prebiotics that are different forms of oligosaccharides, uh, monosaccharides, disaccharides that are good fuel for the bacteria, or you can cook some white potatoes, let them cool off, and then you have these, this great source of prebiotic fuel for your probiotics. So one of the things that I often do is I, when I'm making potato salad, I'll add some sauerkraut and these different types of ferments to it so that I'm getting that mix of probiotic foods with my prebiotic food. Uh, you can also buy potato starch if you just need like a powder form. Potato starch is gonna be a lot cheaper than buying some of these oligosaccharides. Ferments, this is another way that you can support the gut. There's a lot of different information about ferments out there. Uh, some people say that these microbes aren't even actually reaching your gut um, because they are being dropped in that acid bath. There's all these digestive enzymes. Um, you know, I think it's a really fun thing to eat and it doesn't hurt to try, so I'm gonna keep doing it. So ferments can add some diversity. They can at least add some diversity in the bacteria and the microbes that you're exposed to. Same thing is true for being in the soil when you're outside working. Uh, I mean, you can even buy the soil organisms as a probiotic now. And so being outside, working in the ground, getting exposed to dirt, I mean, these are beneficial ways to expose yourself to good bacteria. And then if you want more information about specific foods and the specific constituents within those foods that have different measurable impacts, you can check out this book called Eat to Beat Disease by William Lee. And he's a board certified physician. And what he has done is he noticed that when you look at all of these different health outcomes and diseases, that it basically boils down to five different issues. And that's angiogenesis, uh, problems with your genetics, uh, angiogenesis is going to be the growing of blood vessels and things like that, um, your genetics, 
your microbiome, and then two others that are escaping me right now. Um, but in his section where he talks about your my microbiome, he will discuss how these different foods that you can eat produce these bioactives. And these bioactives are some of these compounds that can be beneficial for your body. And so one of the ways that he got into this research is that he was doing cancer work, and um, they're trying to use immunotherapies for some cancers. And one of the immunotherapies that he was using, it was really, really effective in about 20% of the people that he was giving this therapy to, and it did absolutely nothing in the other 80%. So he wanted to know why is this therapy so effective in this 20%. And what he found is that the people who the therapy was effective with had, I think it's Archmansia is the type, is the species of bacteria that he found in their guts. Um, so what he realized is that you cannot take Archmansia as a probiotic. It can't be cultured in a lab. That's not something you can do. But you can drink pomegranate juice, Concord grape juice, and cranberry juice, and that encourages the growth of this bacteria. So he is a traditional... A physician, he uses complementary therapy. He's, he uses diet as part of his treatment program. Um, so this is actually a really good book if you are interested in learning more about this.